Well, it's Groundhog Day again, and that must mean we're back for another semester of virtual Crown Seminars. Thank you for joining us today. My name is David Siddharth Patel, and it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Crown Center Director Gary Seymour and all the faculty, fellows, and students at the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. We're going to do something a little bit different today. We are going to have a moderated conversation between two of the leading scholars uh, of the movement of people to and across the Gulf, both today and historically. Natasha Skendar and Arash and both of uh, NYU, although different, different branches of NYU. During their talks, I'll post links to their websites in the chat. And we're going to go from 11 o'clock until 12.15. Each panelist I've asked to speak for about 15 minutes. And then we'll invite them to engage with each other and with you, the audience. So that should leave plenty of time for questions and answers and back and forth. So if you have a question for the speakers at any point, please ask it using the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, just hover down there. It should pop up. The Q&A uh, uh, button is the best way to submit a question. The chat room is open, uh, but the panelists will not be monitoring the chat. Crown Center staff will. So again, if you have a question, the best place to submit it is the Q&A button. And I'll select, uh, as a moderating, I'll select questions that I think are most likely to uh, propel the conversation forward. The session is being recorded and will be uploaded eventually to the Crown Center's exciting YouTube page that I encourage you to, to check out. Uh, closed captioning is available. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Natasha Skender, please. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for hosting this amazing conversation, uh, which I'm sure will be very rich thanks to the participation of the audience. Let me just share my screen so that I can uh, take advantage of the fact that Zoom is a uh, visual, uh, a visual uh, medium. There we go. One second, there we go. Okay. So um, the theme of today's discussion is the making of the Gulf. And uh, I wanted to start with a specific case, looking at the making of Qatar. Um, and here I'm gonna be discussing skills, space, and migrant workers in contemporary Qatar. Uh, the presentation draws from my book, which also, uh, which asks, does skill make us human? Um, but it also asks, is skill another word for freedom? It asks, what are the political consequences of defining some people as skilled and some people as unskilled? And one of the answers to that question is the role of skill in shaping how Qatar makes and has made itself. Oops, one second, some technical difficulties here. Uh, Qatar has been making itself for a long time uh, in dramatic bursts of construction from the 1960s onward. This is Doha in 2008. I just wanna draw your attention here to the Sheraton Hotel Pyramid and the Hurricane Building. But Qatar's latest burst of self-making was supercharged after it was awarded the FIFA 2022 World Cup for Soccer hosting rights in 2010. Qatar began the massive construction required for the games almost immediately, funneling hundreds of billions of dollars to reinvent itself as a global destination for sports and culture. Here you can see the same shoreline as in the previous slide picture of Doha, anchored by the hurricane building, which you can see here, and the Sheraton Hotel Pyramid. Take, and this picture is taken just a short decade later. You can see how dramatic and remarkable the transformation has been. The shoreline is a jostle of iconic building next to iconic building, each one of them designed by a different star architect. In the interlude between the two photos of Doha that I just showed, um, the city more than tripled its footprint. It upgraded its infrastructure, uh, it built a new port, a new airport, a new naval base, a new economic zone, a new integrated rail project, which is the largest civil engineering project in the world. Um, the buildings that have received the most attention over the past few months are the eight stadia that Qatar has built for the World Cup. Each of these represents an outstanding design achievement with distinguishing accomplishments in sustainable design, modular construction, geothermal cooling systems, 
But the stadia actually represent just a sliver of the development of Qatar. They represent some $4 billion out of 300 billion dedicated to the rebuilding of Qatar. Um, development has expanded outward into the Bay. The Pearl Qatar featured here is an artificial island spanning nearly four kilometers and is one of the largest luxury mixed use developments in the Middle East. A few kilometers north of Doha, Lusail city extends outward into the city on four man-made islands of 40 kilometers squared. And of course, the massive development has been funded through hydrocarbon revenues. And here you can see a picture of the Barzan LNG processing plant, um, which Qatar has invested in and uh, along with underground six new underground wells and all of the associated infrastructure. I could show you many more pictures of the dramatic buildings and hypermodern infrastructure that Qatar has built, but none of these would have been possible, could have been made to borrow the theme of today's session without the workers who traveled to Qatar from all over the world to build them. Qatar's workforce is 95% foreign, uh, but the labor force in the construction industry is actually 100% foreign. It's an entirely migrant uh, enterprise. Um, and the workforce is profoundly international with workers from Mozambique to Nepal, although workers from South Asia and the Middle East are well represented. Qatar's World Cup ambitions drew a lot of scrutiny to the kinds of conditions workers experienced while building the infrastructure for the games. Human rights and labor organizations documented an array of labor abuses. And you will have, any of you who have been following the Gulf or the World Cup will have seen these. These include wage theft, forced labor, abysmal living conditions, and injury and death. Much of the coverage attributed the extreme labor violations observed, uh, observed to the legal framework in Qatar called the kafela or sponsorship system. This framework formally bound all migrant workers to their employers, but all foreign workers, so the 95% of foreign workers in the economy were governed by the same rules, regardless of wage, occupation, or national origin. And certainly professionals, doctors, executives, hotel managers were not experiencing the same kinds of labor violations. So what was producing the extreme exploitation that construction workers faced in Qatar? And so to understand what, what was producing these violations, I went, um, I, I went to Qatar to understand the work processes in this absolutely critical uh, industry in Qatar. I conducted research uh, in eight languages. Uh, I interviewed a broad array of actors from government to industry leaders to workers. And I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours on Qatari construction sites shadowing workers. It should be obvious by now, Qatari construction is at the global cutting edge. Every single project is ambitious and innovative, and more than a few are the most ambitious and most innovative in the world. What's less visible is how incredibly complex and challenging these structures are to build. They require extremely advanced construction technology and very advanced construction skill. A lot of the design elements are unprecedented feats of engineering and building. But the migrants recruited to build these buildings arrive with minimal construction experience, if any. So companies have to invest heavily in training their workforces. Every single aspect of every single process on the job site is designed to promote on the job learning. The construction sites function as vast training system through which hundreds of thousands of men develop specialized construction skill, you know, on sites of about 8,000 to 10,000 men each. Companies designed highly detailed and proprietary systems to measure and develop worker skill because they actually lived and died based on how well they were able to train their workers. But when I ask managers and supervisors about their workers, the workers whose skill they assessed daily and whose, ad on it, whose advanced skill was critical to their success, they all describe their workers as unskilled. They describe their master scaffolders, their expert welders, their precision platters as unproductive, poor quality, and sometimes just bodies. It became clear to me that skill meant something other than ability. Managers and supervisors were not referring to ability, but were referring to a political category. Unskilled was a subordinate political status. 
the migrants slotted in that category were dehumanized and described as not having the full capacity for freedom. And so their exploitation was made to seem inconsequential and unavoidable. Now, the reason this was possible was that in denying skill, employers were in effect denying learning. And learning, as anyone who has ever been a learner, is an act of freedom. You can't compel, I mean, you can compel someone to do something, but you, you can't compel them to learn. It's an intimate process. It requires imagination, connection, trust, desire, and fundamentally, it requires volition. So in denying learning, you were denying that workers had the capacity for these registers. You were denying their capacity for freedom. And once you deny someone's capacity for freedom, depriving them of their freedom does not seem so consequential. As I began examining skill, not as a measure of ability, but as a political category in which freedom and learning were denied, it became clear to me that the politics of skill shaped all aspects of social and economic life. And uh, while the book ex examines all of these facets, today I want to turn to the relationship to making. Um, and I want to show here very quickly how skill politics in Qatar shape how cities are made, how they are designed, and how they are built. Uh, in its ambitions to make itself, Qatar has adopted for really four decades now a modernist approach to social and urban development. And this is true of countries throughout the Gulf. So modernism is often considered an aesthetic, but it's more accurately described as a method that reverses the standard approach to development in which the goal is to strive to create a future for and with people, a better future. Modernism switches this, reverses this, and defines first an idealized future and then compels people to comply with the future that is envisioned. It's completely top down. And in Qatar, the design for the future was defined. And because there were no people, really, I mean, there were very few people, Qatar actually sought to import people to fit this vision of the future. So uh, just this is Lucille, and here I want to point to uh, the, the, the planning endeavor here. Uh, all of the yellow pieces of this map here are for residential. This is the city of about half a million people that's come online just this year. Um, the different shades of yellow, though, indicate areas that are high security and medium security, depending on how, value, how, how high value a resident you are. Um, to a very real extent, Qatar's modernist bet has worked. Its population has grown with the expansion of the city. This graph shows you the increase of population and its uh, bursts of modernist planning with the footprint of Qatar expanding and finally moving out of Qatar, uh, out of Doha into Lusail. Um, the reason that this has been feasible, of course, is the hydrocarbon revenues that fuel this <laughs> approach. Um, it's big modernist, Qatar's big modernist plans are launched during periods of high oil and gas prices. The organizing principle of this modernist plan is skill, uh, as articulated in Qatar's national development vision of 2030, and you can look around the Gulf to see other national development visions. Uh, Qatar wants to remake itself as a platform for the knowledge economy, populated by elite knowledge workers. And it's very explicit about this. It wants to position itself as a global center for the cultural expression for knowledge workers. But even as Qatar is planning on who to include, who to attract, it's also planning on who to exclude, who it will omit from the future it has planned for itself. Um, since uh, 20. Uh, sorry, 2005, Qatar has banned by law as a matter of policy, workers it classifies as unskilled and here regardless of actual ability, um, which and these workers it has termed bachelor, blue collar worker, manual labor from the city they have built. The government here, and this is a, a color coded map that the government has published to make sure there's no confusion around this, indicating which areas of the city unskilled workers are prohibited from residing in and from circulating in. Um, this is enforced by the police and private security agencies um, and circulating or living in parts of Doha designated as family areas results in uh, deportation and detention. This, oh, sorry, let me just 
flag, this is the area in which uh, workers are allowed to reside in uh, and to move in. This is an aerial picture of the industrial area. You can see the contrast with uh, the gleaming uh, center of Doha. Uh, this is an zo area zone for industrial use, cement factories, chemical plants, construction material storage, equipment parking, and workers. Uh, the, the conditions, uh, these are photos that I took, the conditions in the labor camps in the industrial area have been uh, well documented by international press and human rights organizations as abysmal, unsanitary, unsafe. Um, in response to the, the negative press coverage, the government of Qatar commissioned upgraded living accommodations for workers. And these now uh, limit the number of workers to forder rooms. So some have gym and entertainment facilities, clean kitchens and bathrooms. Um, but as you notice, I don't have photos of the interior of those uh, labor camps because they are highly controlled. They are an expression of what I call upgraded exclusion. And the upgrade comes with uh, a security upgrade. The barracks are monitored by security guard. There are no unsanctioned exits or entry allowed, especially entry by journalists or human rights organizations or researchers. Uh, there are CCTV cameras everywhere. And workers report phone and internet monitoring, especially for, uh, they, they report that uh, their phones are used to geolocate them. So I wanna just end really quickly on what this has meant during the pandemic. Um, on March 11th, 2020, now feels an age ago, when Qatar had about 240 cases, it uh, imposed a lockdown of the industrial area. It drew a cordon sanitaire around the industrial area. Um, and you know, the purpose of a cordon sanitaire is to prevent contagion within, to prevent the overflow of contagion from an area described as disease to the rest of society. So uh, there was no transport in or out, no medical care, no food deliveries. Workers were going hungry in the industrial area. They were uh, allowed out only to work. Uh, they were, uh, the wages of course for this work were mandated but they were not paid and they were not allowed to return to their country of origin. The conditions for contagion within the cordon sanitaire, within the industrial area were very high uh, with lots of crowding um, and lack of nutrition because food was simply not available. Workers were literally going hungry. And outside the cordon sanitaire, you saw amazing health infrastructure being built out and ramped up with a tracing app, excellent health care, a, a really laudable testing regime. And so Uh, were of no consequence. The workers were a means to an end, but they were certainly not envisioned as part of the future that Qatar envisions for itself. Skill is the line that Qatar draws to distinguish its past from its future, and it is the logic it uses to make itself, its built environment, its image, and its society. Here, the idea is that the workers who built Qatar would simply disappear. Thank you so much. That, that, that. I think well, I think Arang's going to do a, more of a, a, a zoom out now and link it to larger historical patterns, and I, I think that's a terrific, uh, uh, terrific compliment to what uh, what Natasha just presented. So please. Uh, you're still muted. Um, let me uh, uh, share uh, some slides that are far fewer than Natasha and far uh, less attractive as well, I think, but, but let's, uh, let's share them nonetheless. Um, okay, is that hopefully there? Okay, so um, thank you to David and Karen and Christina and everyone else at the Crown Center for organizing um, today's event, uh, for inviting me. Um, this has been a uh, uh, kind of a work in progress. We planned this before COVID and, and uh, during COVID, and so I appreciate their patience and uh, accommodation um, on all these fronts. Um, and it's a wonderful pleasure to um, share the stage, or I should say the screen, 
um, uh, with, Na with Na uh, Natasha. Um, for those of you who have not had the opportunity to read her uh, a beautifully written, uh, uh, incisively argued uh, book, I really encourage you to do so. I had the pleasure of reading it um, uh, this winter. And um, it's, I should add, it's great material for the classroom as well. Um, so I'm going to be sharing with you um, some work in progress, uh, but I've also been studying uh, the making of the Persian Gulf uh, for a few uh, years and been thinking about it. Um, when I say um, when I say that, when I say the making of the Persian Gulf, um, I mean how and why was it conceived of as a region? Usually, the term region implies a thing or an object, some sort of geography that clusters countries and places within a relatively uh, clear border and sets it apart from other places or other regions. We can think of this as an abstract sense of space, which implies that regions are timeless and a sort of passive stage on which actions take place. This is what undergirds battles over the nomenclature of the Gulf as either Persian or Arab, as well as the geopolitical discussions of the Gulf as something that is vital for the global economy or US hege hegemony, a region that can, and in fact should be contained, secured and stabilized. I have come to realize that this form of regionalization or region making is both aspirational, that is it's never complete and is oftentimes full of frustrations, but it also obfuscates alternative ways to think about regions ways that are far more dynamic, social, and unbounded, or what the late British geographer Doreen Massey calls an extroverted sense of place. Now, let me give you a feel of what I'm, I'm getting at through a brief uh, um, uh, anecdote. Um, now that I'm inching towards the end of this research pro project, I've come to realize that the origin uh, story of, of my questions and my fascination with the Gulf go back 20 years when I first visited the waters of the Persian Gulf um, uh, for the first time. I made two trips, um, a few months apart from one another in 2001. So this is um, exactly 20 years ago. Um, uh, let me, oh, I'm sorry, let me, am I sharing my? I'm, uh, I'm just can't tell you guys are seeing the slides, right? Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so let me just share this map. As you can see, I've, I've tried to draw your attention to some specific uh, places. Now, in, in January of 2001, I drove from Shiraz to Bandar Abbas and the nearby port cities and islands of Qutesh and Kish. I was motivated by my previous uh, research project on the Tehran Bazaar but also in my general interest in Iran Gardi or tourism. One early morning, my fellow travelers and I went to a small jetty in Bandar Charak, which you can see um, on the southern shore of um, uh, uh, the southern coast of uh, Iran. We boarded a motorboat to travel to the island of Kish. Kish is a, a free trade zone. Um, and in fact, it's one of the oldest free trade zones uh, built, uh, organized in the Gulf region. It goes back to the 1960s, and I'm happy to come back to this if, if any of you are interested. Um, as we waited uh, uh, for the rickety vessel drenched in the smell of gasoline to take off, I noticed a group of about two dozen men, women, and children waiting near the jetty. From their clothing, it seemed like they were locals uh, from humble backgrounds. And given that they had, um, they had sprawled out under the somewhat limited amount of shade, I surmised that they expected to be waiting for a long time. I knew that locals living in the so-called border region were allotted special import passes to bring goods from, the economic zo from, uh, from these economic zones. So I interpreted this site as a mission, uh, uh, mission to travel to Quiche and bring back consumer goods to the mainland, as it's described, back into the mainland or Iran. I, I never found out if I was correct or if my guess was correct, but I su suspected that these people were organized by smugglers, and oftentimes described as parachuters, who, who conscript farmers and their families into coordinated operations 
to transport goods back uh, uh, to the coast and into the Iranian plateau to cities such as Shiraz, Esfahan, and Tehran. In fact, when I returned from Kish a few days later, um, uh, and we drove back towards Shiraz, we had to navigate a gauntlet of checkpoints set up to stymie this sort of illegal trade. Um, or at least there, it was a system in which officials could take a cut um, from this lucrative, uh, this lucrative practice by you know, getting bribes and so on and so forth. Um, we also noticed a shrine where smugglers would visit to make donations, something that the anthropologist Farid al um, also uh, um, uh, observed in her ethnographic research of um, southern Iran. Um, but we also drove through a town um, uh, called Bastak, where we noticed perfectly resurfaced roads, roads spotless bathrooms, and well-stocked grocery stores, or bakalis. Let me go to this. Uh, sorry. Okay. This is Bastak, um, not a photo that I took, obviously. Um, I would later discover that this, uh, this quite pristine town um, uh, was the product of um, centuries of circular migration between Bastak and the Eastern uh, Arabian uh, coast, and specifically Dubai. Now, Dubai was my second visit to the Gulf in 2001. Four months later, after this initial uh, uh, trip, uh, uh, I, I visited um, uh, uh, the United Arab Emirates. I approached the port city not by car or by dhow or, or ship, but instead by airplane. I witnessed more scenes of groups of people sprawled out waiting. This time it was in the airport terminal. The terminal uh, protected uh, people from the sun and the heat, but in Dubai's airport, people had to negotiate, negotiate the, co uh, the cold air conditioning with the help of blankets, and in many cases, sh uh, shawls. As I moved through the terminal with my American passport, I exchanged pleasantries in Persian with Emirati passport control officials. Meanwhile, the large number of men I, that I presumed were from South Asia were directed to the inner bowels of the airport to have their work permits inspected. These were the people who would co construct the spectacular built environment that was well underway in Dubai in 2001. So a few years before um, uh, Natasha's research. They were probably classified as unskilled. Now I understand what, what the political residence of that classification uh, uh, means. These men and women would help expand and operate one of the largest man-made ports in the world, Jebel Ali, which was one of the conduits for smuggled commodities to Iran. Um, they would also clean the offices of holding companies and Fortune 500 firms, and they would take care of children of jet setters and nurse the sick back to health. One day in the midst of conducting interviews with Iranian businessmen, I stumbled upon Bastikia. Uh, sorry, let me see if I can make this work. Not. Hopefully you can see the second image. Um, all right. So this is uh, Bastakia. This was and is a heritage village commemorating some of the oldest homes in Dubai. Completely devoid of visitors, Emirati or otherwise, uh, the pristine homes in the small uh, neighborhood here were named after the city of Bastak that I had visited a few months prior to this. Since then, this quote unquote oldest neighbor, residential neighborhood in Dubai has been re renamed the Al uh, Fahidi Historical Neighborhood. It's wind towers and building materials that could evoke an Indian Ocean littoral society are now uh, deployed to sig uh, signify Emirati culture and are part of the repertoire of, of, of ways to preserve authenticity, national belonging, uh, all in the midst of global rapture and, the so and a so-called demographic threat. What I'm suggesting through these uh, recollections and, and going back to these, my original encounter with the Gulf is that the ways that these people and others, including myself, circulate and inhabit these places are part of the interlaced, interlaced way 
that the region has been socially produced, ways that, count, that run counter to the region being thought of as, two, as a two-dimensional homogeneous unitary entity, or the ways that I initially mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Instead, as a process-driven and re, uh, as process-driven re, uh, and relational, region, regionalization necessarily is contentious, extroverted, and layered. First, it's contentious because not only are there multiple conceptions about what the, the region is or should be or is not and it should not be, but as a lived space, it involves multiple actors, a splintering of spaces, and the proliferations of bordering and bordering practices, beautifully illustrated by the labor camps that, that Natasha just described for us. Hence, the region, uh, the, hence regions are fundamentally uneven. The, um, there are those, uh, there are those that there are those there are people that wait and those that pass through checkpoints. There are those who control their movement and those that have no control over. Uh, over their ability to move. Second, by, by saying that regions are extroverted, I mean that they are always unbounded. They are socially networked to discrete places, from Bastak in Iran to Dubai, from labor recruiters in Bombay to construction sites uh, in, in the Emirates, from FIFA headquarters in Switzerland to sovereign wealth funds in Doha. As such, Gulf regional, regionalisms are intertwined with multiple geographic scales, the global, national, and urban. And regions are, are often co-produced along with nations, cities, empires, and individual identities. So my emphasis on a multi-scalar um, uh, uh, multi approach um, to understanding a regionalism and, and frankly, all spaces. Finally, when I say regions are made and they don't exist out there as a, as a thing, as an object, um, I do not mean that they are fashioned once and for all. Thus, I'm wary and uncomfortable of describing this as a process of forging or manufacturing. Instead, what I'm advocating for is a historicized and layered understanding of time and place. History sem uh, sediments and accumulates into a regional form. The prevailing 20th century geopoliticized view of the Gulf, for instance, as a, quote, an umbilical cord of the free world. This was a, a phrase used by Caspar Weinberger in 1981, um, uh, and, and why uh, ex expressing, expressing why the US needed to contain the Gulf. Um, th this, this is prevailing geopoliticized view, um, uh, for instance, um, exists, but never uh, exists, but it never completely overwrites this 19th century littoral society that, uh, that brought people and places in the Gulf together and continues to do so. And it is these traces that we can, we, uh, I would argue, that we need to hold on to because they also are threads through which we can imagine a remaking of the Gulf in the future. So I'll and with that, and uh, stop sharing. That, 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 that's terrific. And I've, I've, I've got about eight questions of my own. But instead, I'm going to try to pull together some of the threads that uh, people have submitted. And again, if you have questions for either of the presenters or both of them, please submit it via the, the Q&A button. So a couple of the questions get at this, I, this these words you're using, forging, manufacturing, uh, either Qatar or, or the region, the Gulf. Um, Natasha began her presentation with the words Qatar has been has been making itself. And so there's a couple of questions I think that speak to this very directly. One of the attendees anonymously asked if she can comment on the intersection of Qatari politics and the conditions systems she described. To what extent is the system an expression of an authentic social contract among Qataris, government directed economic development on controlled terms with distributed financial benefit, preservation of previous religious, cultural, et cetera. And Obviously not a democracy, Qatari leaders must still account for the demands of domestic interest groups. So who is ultimately responsible for the system? The state or those who take who are taking into account both where, when, and how are Qatari nationals' demands for the preservation of these systems or appeals for change expressed and mediated? And there's a, a similar question earlier about 
uh, the origins of these of these terms, skilled and unskilled, where they came from, were they uh, was it invented? Um, Kia uh, Tersmet asked this question. I apologize if I pronounce the name. I want to know what the Arabic terminology is, and if you can say anything about where the development of those categories came from. Did they appear recently, or do they have a longer history? Thanks for that great question. Um, the the Arabic term used in the legal documents around residents and other things is just simply workers. It's ummel, uh, and it's implied that they are unskilled because only the unskilled are ummel. Um, but this distinction between skilled and unskilled has a long lineage. Uh, and actually relates all the way back to uh, the uh, regulatory systems for labor use under the pearling industry at, at the turn of the 20th century, so 1860s onward. Um, and uh, the structure for that industry was one in which uh, there was a heavy reliance on enslaved workers and indentured workers. And much of the enslavement and indenture was justified along the lines of these workers being unskilled. And then that conjoined, you know, to make a very long trajectory, which I welcome, I, I welcome uh, diving into the book, into the book to get a more detailed um, description, but that conjoined with the British uh, system for indentured labor. Um, indentured uh, labor migration in particular, where there were distinctions around unskilled and skilled that were uh, very explicitly defined in the regulatory structure. And then finally really hardened with the British um, uh, exploitation of oil and gas in Qatar, where their hiring practices defined very clearly the line between skilled and unskilled, with unskilled uh, workers being defined as uh, indigenous or native workers, uh, and skilled workers being workers they uh, imported from the Asian subcontinent. And these categories absolutely had very little or nothing at all to do with skill. And that kind of got solidified in the Kafela system and its many iterations and expressions over the next 50 to 80 years. Um, and I think that this lineage of skill and unskill, the categories, uh, really points to the fact that Qatar and its making is not, is not just a Qatari enterprise. It is absolutely a global enterprise. Um, it is a global enterprise over the long term, but in the more immediate sense, we can see the discussions over labor conditions in Qatar being a global conversation. Um, the companies that operate in Qatar are global, the workforce is global, and the conversations around what are fair labor practices are also global. And any changes Qatar has made, and it has made several over the last couple of years, have been in response to those global conversations. The bigger question around whether this whether these projects of making are a response to domestic political demands, I think is a much more complicated one to answer because it's very difficult to gauge, right? Uh, what the domestic political demands might be in Qatar. I will say that um, the people who, the actors who are most influential in the construction industry are those who are um, well connected in the kind of constellation of the royal family um, the, and uh, have privileged access to labor materials, regulatory clearances and so on. Um, and, and I think that speaks to how construction can double as a form of patronage. Arang, do you want to add anything about the construct? Go ahead. Um, in terms of the metaphor, if I can just uh, pick up a couple uh, themes that N Natasha has raised. Um, I mean, I, what I'm, what I, and I think Natasha are kind of both pushing at is uh, two important things that I want to raise is one is, is this notion of a kind of a co-production. So this notion of who's responsible or who is the primary mover in either these uh, urban plans and urban designs uh, or the making of 
the goal for is inclusionary or exclusionary. Um, to, to me, these are not the right sorts of questions as trying to, in a sense, uh, place the blame on one specific individual. I mean, the stories um, that we that, that I'm in, invested in telling, and I think Natasha tells beautifully in her book, is about these um, a whole series of confluences and um, uh, moments of collaboration and alliances between oftentimes straight, strange bedfellows, British colonial officers and uh, uh, the uh, uh, ruling families, between uh, Iranian um, uh, workers and um, and uh, Arab rulers and so on and so forth. So um, it's it's actually unhelpful to try to keep these actors apart. And in fact, we have to look at them as uh, working together in alliance, but sometimes in conflict, right? So um, I would, I would. So one thing I would push against is push is to push against this notion of of just that there's one single unitary actor doing doing things, doing the making and cons uh, constructing. Obviously, these these workers are literally constructing these buildings, but the management, the corporations, the subcontractors. This is a kind of a. It's almost like a dance that's choreographed in very complex ways, and we have to grapple with that complexity. Um, but the second point I, I kind of to pick up on uh, Natasha's point about, you know, the, you know, and kind of go back to my final comment is to, to think about this as a layered history, right? So we can't fully understand the kafala system without understanding the, the, the challenges facing both the British and these newly anointed uh, rulers, Arab rulers, wanting to control, control the movement of, of, of people in and out of their out of their countries or out of these spaces uh, and that they needed, but also the challenges that these workers themselves presented to them. I, I won't go into the details, but many of these legal structures and regulations were in response to strikes, protests, to pearl divers, for instance, going uh, becoming unemployed when the, the pearling market crashed and they basically were um, left uh, to their own devices. So um, this is again to point to this is the structures are a manifestation of these, if you want, micro level struggles or intimate uh, uh, relationships. So I, I would, you know, in response to kind of the question is that's, I think, um, uh, the kind of our, our use of this language of the making of, of, of the Gulf. This is what we're, we're trying to, uh, to, to point out. And then I should be obvious, but I should just add, if the Gulf is being made or recreated or these places are being made, um, um, that implies that it's not outside of history, right? Uh, what I think is, we're all, uh, to, to put some words in Natasha's uh, mouth here, we're both pushing for a notion that the region is not outside of, of the world. It's not exceptional. It, um, it's part of capitalism. It's part of global capitalism, and it has been for uh, uh, decades, if not centuries, going back to pearling, going back to the oil, oil sector. So we actually have to kind of think of it in relationship to processes taking place in other places. This is why I emphasize this notion of an extroverted or unbounded uh, understanding of, 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 re of regionalism that takes us all the way to Bombay, all the way to Switzerland, to New York, and so on and so forth, rather than treating this area as some enclosed um, uh, and historically uh, uh, exceptional space. So wait, just, we got enough good, go ahead. Just one, one last point to add to that, to underscore Aron's point. I think the most important uh, development for the Gulf uh, with Qatar as its focus, but thinking about Qatar in relationship to its neighbors, is the conflict over Ukraine, where uh, Russia has um, uh, threatened implicitly not to deliver its natural gas to Europe, and where now Qatar, as the uh, holder of the third largest natural gas reserves, are it sees its star ascendant with a meeting at the White House and a declaration of Qatar as an ally and. And this will reshape the Gulf in ways that really don't originate in the Gulf at all, but are uh, where the Gulf is looped into these global geopolitical trends. We've got a lot of great questions, but I, I, I do want to zoom out a little and generalize because you have a couple of questions along those lines. So Professor Bellin from, from the Crown Center, uh, obviously directly towards Orang, is the fluidity and collaborative creation 
a region in the Gulf true for other regions of the world, Middle East, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, or is there something unique about the process in the Gulf? And along the same lines, there's a question for uh, Natasha by um, Emanuela Buscemi. The, the concept of politics of skill, although conceptualized on the Qatar case study and applicable to GCC countries, do you feel that concept would also work in other regions of the world? For instance, Latin America, intersecting coloniality, neoliberal capitalism, place and gender. You, you, met, you touched on this briefly when you mentioned a global enterprise, but I was hoping each of you could just briefly explicitly uh, hit, hit that generalizability question. Sure, sure. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll take, uh, um, I think it's uh, uh, Eva Bellin's uh, question about is my disc discussion or description of the Persian Gulf region, am I describing just the Gulf or is this something, a lot broader point about regional regionalisms and regionalization? Um, no, I mean, on the, on the broader scale, I mean, I'm, I'm basically building on decades of um, exceptional work by uh, geographers, um, um, uh, human social geographers who make this point about space, space making. Um, so I'm not doing anything original here. And, and so I, I'm and, and applying it in a sense to, to the Gulf. So yes, my, my notion of regionalization being fundamentally um, a, 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 a way to look at politics and contention, to examine, uh, to, to think about it as being extroverted, um, and, uh, and something that is, uh, is built over time is it would apply to regionalization in Africa or uh, South Asia or Latin America and so forth. So uh, I would like to think these ideas are quote unquote um, trans transferable, transportable and so forth. And many good scholars have, have, have been doing these sorts of things. The, let me just add one thing though, um, in my reading, um, However, there is not to, to throw in a little bit of exceptionalism here. One of the things that makes, and here I'll say the Middle East, um, not the Gulf, the Middle East somewhat distinct in the mid 20th century is that we have to recall and grapple with that the United States was deeply invested in constructing a new Europe, right? Uh, specifically the EU. So we can't forget that in, in the mid 20th century, the US was a force for, for ultimately creating the EU. It supported that level of uh, regionalization for political reasons, for, for, uh, for economic reasons. So reach one of the world regions, the, the, uh, Europe, will had the backing of, uh, of, of the US in the 1950s, 60s, and, and so forth. Similarly, when it comes to East Asia, scholars such as Peter, uh, Peter Katzenstein and others have also pointed that the US here the US capital and state together were deeply invested in constructing a sort of East Asian regionalism with Japan as the central hub and this kind of hub and spoke method. So again, the global hegemon, the US in the 1950s, after World War II was deeply invested in creating an integrated, uh, primarily in the East Asia case through, um, through uh, uh, capital investments and, 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 and uh, manufacturing a deeply in, in, in invested uh, East Asia. On my reading of the history of the Middle East and the Gulf region, the, the exact opposite happens. First, the British and then, uh, and then some, uh, subsequently the US were deeply invested in actually disorganizing the Persian Gulf region, keeping people, places apart, right? Why do we have all of these city-states separated from one, one another? There were actual, uh, attempt attempts. There weren't attempts to create um, uh, a, 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 an EU in the Gulf, right? And in fact, there are a lot of attempts to to prevent the development of such things, right? And even if people want to talk, even this the the organization, the GCC, can be viewed as quite exclusionary because neither is Iraq nor Yemen nor Iran, let alone Pakistan and India. None of them are involved in it, right? So it's actually a very exclusionary way, way to create a regional organization. But we can talk about that too. So I want to just uh, underscore again uh, Arang's beautiful answer that these uh, the generalizability of this principle of placemaking being uh, a layered and extroverted I love that phrase process um, is is in some ways not the most interesting piece of the story. The most interesting piece of the story is the processes that make it up which is, I think, what uh, Arang has pointed to so carefully. And that, I think, allows us to explore 
um, the different power structures that are formed through placemaking and the ways they're hardened. So uh, one of the fascinating things for me is to think now about how the Gulf is placemaking in other places. Its influence on development practices throughout the Middle East and North Africa really can't be uh, overstated. It's you know, it's, it's influence in particular, for example, on Egypt and in the construction of New Cairo and, and a series of different plans using this kind of modernist approach where you just impose the new structure, both built and social on society and you just expect them to comply, right? And this backed by uh, significant financial support. So paying attention to the placemaking allows us to see how the GCC, how the Gulf is in particular also involved in placemaking. Um, but to the point about skill and skill categories in particular, and whether we see it in other regions of the world, I would say most definitely. Um, and I, and you know, I'm sitting, I'm zooming in from Mexico now where another research stream touches down. And I see it play out in many different ways. And there are two ways I wanna highlight in this answer. The first, um, and possibly most obvious is through uh, immigration policy. Uh, you know, this is true in Latin America. It's true also in, in the countries that are touched by the EU's immigration policies, where skill is increasingly being used uh, to um, reframe the shift to a more restrictive immigration regime, where we, uh, the move toward merit-based immigration uh, has supplanted uh, conversations that are more explicitly racist. Um, so, and, and the fact that the immigration regimes of the global North, for lack of a better term, um, you know, those immigration regimes play out, are implemented far south of those uh, borders, right? So whether it's the camps on the US-Mexico border, because of the Remain in Mexico program that the Biden administration relaunched or uh, uh, immigration regimes in Colombia that are, that are shaped actually very directly by the US and so on and so forth. Um, so there you see the, the really explicit um, connection, but the, the, the less explicit and possibly more pernicious connection is the ways in which skill attaches to other markers of social difference. So race, indigeneity, class, and it becomes a justification that seems technocratic, that seems apolitical for social stratification along those lines. And you definitely see that uh, expressed in locally contextual ways in economies around the world. Um, and what I call for through this study on Qatar is really a broader examination of the political use of skill not as a measurement of ability, but as a political category that justifies stratification and dehumanization. So, sure, I got so many questions, and not just about NYU Abu Dhabi. But, so there's, there, I think it's important. We also talk, we've talked a lot about the state's use of these categories and restricting mobility, restricting categorization. I think it's also important to get at re resistance, challenges to them. And so I'm going to use one of uh, a question from my colleague, Pascal Menere, as a jumping off point for that. Uh, he mentioned that uh, uh, Dr. Skender's presentation ended with a, a mention of border spatiality and the temporality of unskilled labor in Doha. To what extent, he asks, are migrants resisting these restrictions and how? The cases of Saudi Arabia and the UAE uh, show how unstable the notion of temporary labor is and how spatial limitations also are played with and encroached upon. How does Qatar fit into this? So, um, you know, I think that there are many ways of conceptualizing resistance. There can be resistance at the work site to contest the treatment that stems from the representation of workers as unskilled. And certainly I saw this on work sites throughout Qatar. I, every single site I was on had experienced a wildcat strike at one point or another, even though these are not covered by the press. And, and there are certain very clear reasons why that happens. Companies are very good at managing these strikes, determining which strikes are quote unquote, just blowing off steam and which strikes are actually a threat to management and result in immediate deportation. And I won't go into the details of why that happens, but 
I, I would say that in the temporality question and this resistance question, right, that the implicit thread in that question is, is presence a kind of resistance? And, um, you know, the, is, is the fact that migrants are present uh, a, a refutation of the idea that the future of Qatar is these knowledge elite workers? And I would say that Qatar has been really deliberate in planning for that. And it has expanded its construction of these kind of upgraded forms of exclusion with these you know, fancier labor camps uh, with the security apparatus around them to 250,000 beds. And what that means is I think Qatar is planning for a future where this big modernist push ends uh, and you have about a quarter million workers to maintain the, the structures um, and that they will be very carefully confined and monitored uh, in these spaces. So Qatar is planning for a long-term exclusionary practice where you have workers available to maintain the structures, the built environment, but you do not uh, envision a situation where they will be there long-term. So I, I feel like you've, you've talked a little bit about this question, Natasha, and Orang touched on it very briefly, but there's, there's, we're still getting a lot of questions about directly addressing the extent to which unskilled is a euphemism for race. And I, I, I want you to come back and just hit that head on because uh, three or four people have asked about this racialized classification of skilled, unskilled, semi-skilled, but also has it changed over time? Uh, throughout history or through since independence and what the role of uh, colonialism was in creating that uh, legacy. And this is also a question for Orang region-wide. So I'll just say that absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's the head on one line answer. Absolutely. Unskilled is a racialized category for sure. Um, how it's racialized changes over time and has changed over time. So under the British, certainly indigenous native workers, which by the way, uh, quote unquote, Qatari workers with Qatari nationality chits were from all over the region, right? So this is a, it's kind of a racial uh, expression of kind of racial blindness where the British couldn't actually tell a Yemeni from a Qatari from an Iraqi from an Irani, right? Like it just, they were all natives. Um, and that uh, classification has changed over time as the political structures have changed, as the legal structures have changed, as the migration structures have changed, um, but it still remains very much enforced and remains uh, very much in force in ways that are very specific and often very specific at specific uh, project sites. So uh, on some project sites, uh, Nepalis, for example, were viewed as docile, uh, kind of, uh, uh, hard working workers who would work for less and work under more difficult conditions and who you could treat badly. Whereas on other site, they were viewed as master scaffolders because they were from a mountainous region and weren't afraid of heights, right? So these racialized, under, whether or not they were actually master scaffolders had very little uh, to, to do with the categorization. Um, uh, other examples include the idea that Ethiopian or Egyptian workers were more resistant to the heat and so therefore didn't need protective equipment when handling hot metal. So I interviewed workers with burns on their hands because their employers felt that as black Ethiopians, as black Egyptians, right, the categorization, they didn't need protection from the heat. So things like that really played out and there were um, stratifications on site designed to pit workers ethnically, nationally, and racially against each other as a way to maintain labor discipline. Um, if I can actually first go back to this question of resistance for, for a moment, and I'll, I'll pick up the, the thread on, 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 on race and, and, and other categories. I mean, I, I understand we, we like to reach out and, and, and valorize resistance, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's a very loaded concept. And, and, no, I would. I mean, not to get too uh, too much into language, but I mean, I, I hold on to the notion of contested. Uh, yes. Yeah, so for me, there are there are alternative ways that this this 
this uh, physical space can be thought of as a region. And they're, they're continuously contested. It's never settled, right? Uh, that's what I'm kind of proposing. So someone had asked the question about free trade zones. So when you look back at the kind of the history or the genealogy of free trade zones and bring it all the way up today, you can see that there is this alternative notion of the region not being as a not being a, an enclosed container or being a littoral uh, uh, littoral kind of society, but instead being a global scene, a corridor, something that another uh, uh, geographer Deborah Cowan describes as part of the logistics revolution, in which once capitalism moves to this kind of um, kind of hyper neoliberalized globalized kind of setting with the global fa factory, then Log uh, this logistics revolution is all about rapidly moving products, commodities from, you know, from east to west, from, from, from China to the US. And politicians, uh, 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 firms position the Gulf beginning in the 1970s as, a, as an essential global seam. And this is what Caspar Weinberger was getting at with the notion of umbilical cord. That is a very different understanding of what the Gulf region is than um, the Carter doctrine of the region as this being this contained blob that the U.S. has to control. So, what I what I would say is it's not this is not a and and the the, the people that I described here in my talk they are producing a regionalism that connects vast stack to the uh, to vast stack in Dubai and so on and so forth, right? But at, these are very these are alternative uh, regionalisms that at moments abut and can and, and challenge. Um, uh, the, these other uh, these other uh, types of, of region making, right? So for me, it's, it's more interesting to think about contestation rather than than resistance, because um, uh, I mean I think you get there's, there's a anyway I think that's a useful lens to, to think about it. But the point about skilled and unskilled, I really encourage everyone to read uh, Natasha's book. I don't work for Princeton University Press. I don't get one percent or two percent or anything like that. Um, but but it's it, she really. I think does a wonderful job in showing the, the contradictions in how this category of, of skilled and unskilled um, kind of emerge. And the one of the example that comes to mind from our work is that when the Qataris try to limit the rental of properties to, um, to bachelors, lo and behold, doctors and accountants that didn't have family were had their leases canceled and their electricity shut off. Because they, hold, because they were bachelors by definition, right? So then the Qataris have to rework that definition. So I think, again, um, to, to kind of harp on the point is to think of these, the relationship between race, nation, gender, skilled and unskilled as is continuously in flux um, and being re reworked. So of course, r race matters, right? So when you go back to the beginning of the, um, uh, 20th century, um, and you, uh, th the way that these categories of what an Iranian is and what a Kuwaiti is, how these categories are defined, these are not easy, simple um, definitions, right? And and here I'll I'll I'll, I'll tout um, uh, Alex Padrukas's work and dissertation where he really tries to th think through the, the challenges of defining who, who how this how these lines are drawn, right? And one of the ways that those lines are drawn are property. If you're a property owner, right, you get to be on one side of, the, of that boundary, Iranian or Kuwaiti or, or not. And this is, and you know, my, I, mean, I was trying to be subtle, but maybe I should have been a little bit less subtle. You know, I was able to fly to Dubai with an American passport, right? And Iranians that don't have their American passport can't do that, right? So they're, what, and kind of thinking more broadly is just to push a notion of borders as being strategically porous. All borders are that way, right? They're designed to let prevent certain things from coming through, right? Like a membrane, uh, but allow other things to make uh, come through. So to, to think of these borders as uh, membranes and porous membranes that are designed to be, to allow the movement of some things and the repelling of other things. And that's where these other categories of property ownership, passport, race, uh, uh, play an important role, right? And how affect, affect people's lives and their ability to move and how they move and so forth. 
So we, we have a, a lot of questions. And I apologize in advance if I'm not able to get to everyone's questions. You clearly aren't going to be able to. And uh, this is going to be an abrupt transition to something really micro. But Nader Habibi has a question about reforms in, in Qatar. He asked about, about a year ago, Qatar raised the minimum wage for unskilled workers to $275 per month, plus $100 to $125 in food and housing allowance per month. Uh, is that policy enforced? How does it compare to other GCC countries? And uh, he also asked, did you have a chance to talk to Qatari political elite about the conditions of unskilled workers and what their reaction was? So I'll start by saying that uh, I did talk to lots of Qatari elite uh, in government and outside of government. And many of them were actually deeply concerned about the welfare of workers. Um, so right, like it's not a monolithic uh, picture here. And actually one of the reasons or the kind of motivations for this study to begin with was a discomfort with some of the anti-Arab and Orientalist portrayals of labor conditions in the Gulf uh, and in Qatar specifically. Um, so right, like it's a new, it's a complex picture as in any context. Um, the reforms are, are interesting, right? So uh, one of the fascinating things for me about Qatar with its expect amazing slogan for the World Cup is that in some ways it really has pulled off the amazing. It has, it has built uh, a new set of spaces that are just fantastic and remarkable and amazing. And the logistical and regulatory work behind that is just phenomenal. It's just incredible. The, the growth in the capacity of government there has been just astonishing. And alongside that, the reforms to guarantee workers basic rights have taken a decade and have taken a decade with uh, lots of handholding and pressure, international pressure and handholding from the ILO. Um, the reforms that have been put in place, uh, just to en enumerate them carefully. So prior to these, to this very recent, just a couple of years old wave of reforms, workers could not quit their jobs for any reason. They could not withhold labor, even in cases of forced labor, abuse, wage theft, et cetera. Um, they could not leave the country at will. They had to get their employer's permission to leave the country, and this created uh, uh, basically a formal system of bonded labor, but also created lots of heartache, for example, when Nepali workers were unable to leave the country to bury their family members after the earthquake in 2015. Um, and they could not change jobs. Uh, the minimum wage uh, was, there was no minimum wage, and it has uh, it was implemented in 2019 and then ratcheted up a little bit to the, the level at which it's at now. Um, so the, the thing that I'll say about those reforms in terms of what they mean, so $275 for some of the most experienced construction workers in the world at the end of a decade of construction uh, in which they were paid uh, routinely less than that, about 800 riyadh, uh, which is about $200. That really, you know, it doesn't seem so consequential to me. It just doesn't. I mean, the fact that we need to wait for a decade to get this kind of reform seems pretty inconsequential to me. But, um, right, the reforms have happened and how, um, how available they are to workers is a, is a real question. So workers are technically able to change jobs now. But anyone who has looked at the ability of workers to actually circulate through space in Qatar means knows that they cannot actually go seek another job. And what that what this change in regulatory structure means is that employers are able to take workers from one project and move them to another. Um, so right, like what these reforms look like on paper differs. I would say that compared to other Gulf countries. Um, these reforms are not remarkable. Uh, the UAE has uh, more significant reforms in place. And because it is, for example, less controlling of worker movement through space, um, given the fact that we've focused on space today, those reforms are actually much more meaningful. So in, in other words, you have to look at these uh, reforms on paper as part of a constellation of making practices and their significance emerges from the making practices we've discussed today. 
So we only have a few minutes left, uh, and I, I want to let everybody know we are we do pour copy the question, send the questions to the two speakers. So I apologize in advance if we didn't have a chance to ask your question. They will get them, and I encourage you to to reach out to them via email, Twitter, Facebook, every every way to to to, to talk to them about their work. And there are some questions about uh, uh, Professor Skender's field work, and I highly recommend picking up her book where she she covers a lot of the details on how she did her work. So I want to end with uh, uh, combining two questions, which, again, which hopefully will bring you two in dialogue with each other for a few last minutes. Uh, Mona Elkobashi noticed some parallels and contrasts between Natasha's definition of modernism as top-down visions into which people are made to fit and Arang's concept of regionalization as a perpetually contested process or struggle. Is, regionalism, is regionalization a form of political modernism? And does modernism produce uh, uh, resistance? I know, I know there's a lot in there, but I also wanna combine that with Sarah Hahn's question, which uh, speaks to about, she asks about how, if you could speak to how narratives of past and future and urban planning work to produce and reinforce these categories and in, in regional categories. I think those two questions about uh, urban planning and modernism, I think fit well and hopefully will I'll give you a, a final chance to engage with each other before we have to wrap up in about four minutes. Okay, uh, I'll just say that um, regionalism and modernism are actually maybe two sides of the same coin, right? So modernist uh, planning and its and its elan is, is designed to impose a future, um, but futures aren't imposed; they are they are co-produced. They are produced through top-down planning. They are produced through resistance. They are produced through geopolitical pressures, right? So the top-down planning is an impetus uh, and it reflects a political structure where it's possible, uh, but it is only part of the story. And I think Arang's work does a beautiful job in illustrating for us how these many threads come together. Um, and I think what's common to both of our work is that we're interested in the ways that these threads come together in the built environment and how they, the built environment comes to express uh, these politics. In other words, the built environment are politics made concrete. Natasha said it uh, you know, very well. I, um, and the, the one to, to respond to Mona's kind of publication about his regionalism and mo modernism, uh, my kind of way of getting it is I think, yeah, there's some, uh, there's definitely, uh, as, as Natasha just said, there, there, there is, they are intimately related. And for me, the way they're related is that they both beg the question of regional, uh, regionalism for whom? Modern, moder modernism for, for whom, right? So it's perfectly, all of these different types of regionalism that I, I, I kind of detect in the built environment that are in a sense expressed through the routes that people move the, to the, uh, the borders that are built, uh, the, 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 the high rises that are built and so forth. For me, are, what, what's interesting about those things is they allow us to contemplate, well, who, who's regionalism? Regionalism for whom? A Gulf, uh, a Gulf regionalism from, for whom? And who, are, who gets to enjoy the benefits of that regionalization and who's excluded, who's exploited, who gets to stay there permanently, but always in a state of limbo, uh, this kind of permanent temporary category um, that we all know about, um, who are simply not recognized because they are stateless and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, in both, when, it, when the question of modernism and regionalism for me always provokes the question of uh, uh, for whom who gets to be modern? Who gets to be regional? Let me just say, just looking at the, the the people who ask questions and who attended the talk and the way people engage with your work, it's quite remarkable. There's there's political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, urban studies scholars, all different people approaching and engaging with your work from from different disciplinary fields. And I I think that's just a sign of a terrific talk and uh, and, and 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 projects that both of you are pursuing. So I just want to thank both of you for getting us off to a terrific start uh, this semester. Uh, which hopefully will be the last uh, virtual semester. Um, and uh, I encourage everyone to join us in uh, uh, about six weeks as winter will continue for that time, the Groundhog says. On March 2nd, we'll have Katerina Scaramelli from Boston University 
speaking about how to make a wetland, water and moral ecology in Turkey, which is based on her book, which just won the uh, honorable mention for the prestigious Alba Harani Award from the Middle East Studies Association. So that's March 2nd. And uh, until then, please join me in virtually thanking our, our two speakers. Thank you very much. And uh, hope look forward to seeing all of you soon.